<clears throat> Good evening, everybody. We're getting settled. We've got a great crowd tonight for an amazing guest. Uh, Christine Vile is with us tonight um, to share her amazing book. Uh, we were just visiting briefly as doing our tech check. I'm embarrassed that I did not read this book immediately when it came out. I've wasted seven good years of my life without the uh, knowledge in this book. Um, and it's just terrific to have such a great crowd of regulars and new folks tonight. Um, Noel Baldwin, thank you for joining us again from Kalispell. I think this is your eighth or ninth uh, book club. Ed Wilson, good to see you back. Ed had to miss the last one from North Carolina. Judge, thank you for being here. Um, always great to see Carl and Candy, of course. Um, Mayor Gray and, and Mrs. Mayor in, uh, in Great Falls. Stacy Flaherty from Portland, Oregon. Um, it's just so wonderful to have people from all over the country. In fact, if you wouldn't mind, take a minute. If you're, if I didn't shout you out, out, kind of tell us where you're from in the chat, so we can, we can kind of get an account of the states that are represented here. I know we've got all the time zones represented uh, across across America, and that's just terrific to gather glacier lovers from all over the country. I'm Doug Mitchell. I have the privilege of being the executive director of the Glacier National Park Conservancy. I'm joined by two of my amazing coworkers, Grace Kinsler, who will be handling the questions and chat uh, tonight, and Sean O'Leary, who with, without whom um, none of the data would happen at the Glacier Park Conservancy. So if you hear from us, um, it's, it's Sean, uh, Sean and Jill and Christine you have to, to thank for us. And we are joined tonight by a very, very special guest, somebody who literally has um, sweated and bled on Glacier's trails. Uh, for many years, and um, you know, will we'll always be a part of our glacier family. Uh, Christine Bile and Christine, um, all of you have read her book, so we, we won't have to review too much of that. But it is a book that was a Willow Award finalist for nonfiction, uh, was a Spring Top Ten pick by Amazon, and one of Shelf Awareness's top ten nonfiction books of 2013. And for all of us who have read it, we are not surprised. It's a it's a remar remarkable work by person who not only has worked in the dirt, but also uh, has her MFA um, from the University of Alaska Anchorage. Christine, thank you for um, sharing some valuable time with us tonight. Thanks, Doug. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Grace, for getting it rolling. Thanks, everybody. It's great to see you. So we, we talked a, a little bit um, as we were, as we again, we're doing our, our tech check um, about you know, it's been a while since you've been uh, on the trails in the park and, and you wrote in your book about, again, the book 2013-2014 era uh, about the park being overcrowded because in that time it was welcoming a million guests over a five month period of time. But thankfully, we locals got it back in September. And, you know, this year uh, we will, Glacier's already over 3 million visitors. It had 700,000 visitors in the month of September alone. And it, it brings this idea, this conversation about loving something to death, right? And, and I know that's dear to you, kind of, you, you've thought a lot about that, you've written about it. Um, how, tell, tell us a little about your thought process about how we balance making sure people have access to these special places, but making sure they stay special. Yeah, that's the perennial question in um, in public land management and use, I think. Um, to clarify a little bit, my book came out in two, 2013, but I actually left employment in Glacier in 2002 was my last season. So really the difference in visitation that I was familiar with compared to what you're seeing now is almost 20 years. Gotcha. Um, and, uh, you know, back then in the early, two I started in the park in 90, uh, six, I believe. So the late nineties to early two thousands now seems like, I don't know, like a lost era really almost in the sense that, you know, a lot of the glaciers that my crew would, would backcountry ski on all summer long are barely even visible slivers of glinting ice anymore. So there are a lot of changes in the last 20 years that are very, um, graphic to me when I think about glacier. Um, I would say that, uh, I don't know, like a lot of seasonals, it, um, we have this weird uh, kind of blend of pride in sharing the park as a public resource and proprietariness as if it's, it's just ours and we're the real, 
you know, the real users, um, which all, all seasonals go through a little bit of that, I think, until they become more local and kind of start to experience it more as a place of a, more of a long-term connection. But um, I would say, I, you know, I, the, the biggest thing about use that has become um, a bit of a touchstone for me over the last decade is, is more, more about um, egalitarian use and the ability of people of all kinds and types and um, ages and abilities and colors and um, sizes to use public lands. And uh, I think one really great thing about the conversation around public lands and, um, and access to them has been around that. How do, we, how do we move them from being this kind of rarefied experience for people who can afford it or who live no near it or who were taught to experience it with their families and open that up to the knowledge that all people have a right and a, um, I think a, the, um, I don't know, birthright and a, um, a necessity to be encouraged to use them as if they were their own. They're, it's a collective uh, um, ownership, I think. And um, the way that interacts with, you know, original users and indigenous people and communities, I think is really important. Um, so more than focusing just on visitation numbers, um, which I mean, as long as the human race continues to exponentially expand, we're gonna have more people on trails. So my job as a trail builder is to build the trails as best I can so that they hold up to increasing use. And I think my job as an advocate has been more and more leaning toward how do we make those spaces um, open and comfortable to anybody who wants to use them. Yeah, I think that's, that's a hugely important point. In fact, our kind of bookends to this discussion, last month's book was Black Faces, White Spaces by Carolyn Finney. She's um, amazing. <laughs> she's amazing. She's a tour de force. Um, and a lot of it, this group was on that. It's a, very, it's a really important and challenging topic to your point. They're public places, right? They're, they're public is everyone. And next month we'll be featuring uh, one of our board members who has edited a book, The Salish and the Lewis and Clark Expedition, and thinking about how we make sure uh, we are always including the, you know, the glacier's first people, right? We, we, we didn't invent this park. Um, uh, others, others did, and we, we live on that, on that legacy. Um, Carolyn Coughlin, who is one, another one of my coworkers, is on this call shared with us today on a staff meeting that she was able to go out to your point of accessibility. Um, and is that the beach actually behind you in your, in your screen, Carolyn? Yeah. Um, this is uh, uh, the, what will be the first ever ADA fully handicap accessible backcountry campground in Glacier National Park. Um, this is at the Lake McDonald campground. So this is the one in between Fish Creek um, yep. and the Kelly camp. Yep. Um, you know, and, and because of the donations of people who are here on this call tonight, um, we were able to make that happen because that's not something the park can afford, right? The park can't afford the Native American Speaks program, but it's critically important. Uh, the park can't afford an ADA accessible trail around Swift Current or an ADA campground, but private philanthropy can help because we need to remain committed to that access issue. So thank you for continuing that advocacy and, um, and it's really, really important. Um, the, you know, you, you, I know people are going to have a bunch of questions before we get to those, um, Christine has some slides. So if you want to share your screen and kind of walk us through some photos and some, some, some stories, then we'll kind of come back with some questions. Okay. I just have a quick, uh, few photos to introduce you a little bit to me. Can you see that? Okay. That's a kind of late, late December, um, uh, mid. November, late, early December light up in Healy in the interior of Alaska where I live now. Um, I, full disclosure, I'm on the East Coast with everybody. I was just telling uh, Doug and Sean and Grace that uh, I'm visiting my in-laws right now west of Philadelphia. So um, I'm on the East Coast time with you right now. But this is what it looks like at home for me right now. Um, I get a lot of questions since the book came out in 2014. And um, I refer to a few transitional things. People always want to know, where are you? Are you still married to Gabe? Are you still living in a yurt? This kind of stuff. So I just threw in a few um, slides about that. Um, let me see if I can figure out how to advance this now. There we go. There's my, our yurt in the snow. Um, and there's a, another little outbuilding on our property during the fireweed bloom we had this past um, summer. So those are the, um, the two uh, kind of anchoring seasons in my neck of the woods. Um, these are the tracks uh, that we see typically in the snow. Um, 
I always like it when the snow comes back because I can start seeing again the evidence of all the critters who share our acres with us who skirt by mostly unnoticed uh, <laughs> in the um, seasons without snow. But um, we had a great gray owl in a uh, spruce tree next to our yurt porch this past fall, which was astounding. I don't know if you've ever seen a great gray um, in person, but they are incredible. Um, we have a fox, a um, couple great horned owls and um, wolf tracks. And these are a little couple different rodents um, and ski tracks, of course, which are our main contribution in the snow. Um, these are some other seasons from my home life. That's uh, the picture um, with the, the uh, mountains in the background is uh, out the road from my property. Um, some of you may have read the book Into the Wild about um, Christopher McCandless, the young Miss, Miss, uh, the idealist with the misfortunate, unfortunate end um, who went out the stampede trail and starved to death uh, across the river in Denali National Park. So that's the road I live on. And that's kind of out that way toward that. Um, there's a little finger of, of uh, Denali that kind of extends into um, uh, private land holdings around it. So it's a really cool little neighborhood that has a pocket of um, Denali's northern wilderness in it. And then that picture to the right is the aspen grove on the edge of our, our acres looking out over a, um, undeveloped creek land down below. That's the inside of my yurt. Um, you can see the, the uh, little <laughs> uh, thing my, my niece and nephews made for me that says yurt work at the top of my bookshelf. That was them being very clever. <laughs> and people often ask me what my desk looks like or what my, uh, my writing studio looks like. And I live in a lot of small spaces. So I often say that my studio is in my head and it goes into whichever chair I am currently sitting. <laughs> I don't have a lot of space um, for a huge uh, writing studio, but um, I can kind of make some spaces in wherever I am. Um, in, in light of more space, uh, my husband Gabe and I are building a, um, a hand built uh, um, traditional scribe fit um, post and beam cabin. Um, and these are just a couple pictures of our progress on that. Um, you can see a lot of Tyvek that is often referred to as Alaska's exterior, Alaska's most common housing exterior. Um, we'll put uh, ship, uh, um, um, ship left siding over that probably next year. Um, that's a backcountry camp in the Alaska range from our, our big project this last summer. Gabe and I started our own business right around the end of the book. I refer to that, that we started our own business in the private sector. And we've been doing that for about 13 years, I believe about 2008, we started and um, we've done a lot of different types of work over the years, you know, everything from mini mechanized equipment, building gravel trails, building mountain bike trails with mini excavators to um, bridges and um, uh, teaching trainings. Uh, and last year we, or this past summer, we returned to our roots. We hired for the first time a six person uh, hand field crew and we're building a 15 mile um, pretty remote uh, connector trail um, in Denali uh, State Park. So I spent a lot of the summer prior doing layout with a lot of helicopter support. Um, and these are just some pictures from that, um, that job. This is my motto, um, Salvatore Ambulando. It's typically credited to St. Augustine, although there may are some crossover references that are pretty similar in Zen Buddhism as well. It is solved by walking. It seems to have been my mantra for most of the troubles in my life, whether it's making a living or working out something in my mind. Um, so those are a lot of the different steps I've taken uh, in the last year or two. Um, these are a couple shots from the construction of the crew this past uh, year. The Pulaski is central still in my life. Um, it, uh, you know, it takes up a lot of space in the book and it um, is still one of the tried and true that I take most places I go. Um, and um, yeah. I didn't want to be the one who makes it sound like trail work and backcountry work is all roses and cookies, as my <laughs> my uh, mom's mom used to say. So there's our pictures of the black fly infections that I had on my neck mm -hmm. and the bushwhacking through Devil's Club and Alder and rain and uh, all of that stuff is still present as well. Here are a couple of blasts from the past for uh, anybody who um, was uh, wondering why there weren't pictures in the book. I've had people say that over the years, like, oh, you should have had photos of all these characters in your book. So the one up on the upper left is a, um, a crew. Um, Gabe is there with the ponytail behind um, 
a couple of others. Uh, actually, one person, Mark Dundas, is in the background there. He, some of you might know him from either Park Service Connections or he does a lot of avalanche work in the Flathead, um, big backcountry skier, and uh, um, works has worked doing forecasting for a lot of years. Um, and I can't quite make out who's in the very back there, but that's me in the middle on the, on the Punjar, <laughs> um, drilling the outhouse hole up at Sperry in 2002. I'm sure it's full by now and it's been done again since, but, and on the upper right there is my friend um, uh, in the book. Her name is, um, uh, I just totally spaced on what her name is in the book. Um, Tracy, I think, who was one of my first uh, crew leaders. And um, she and I <clears throat> posed there in front of the toe of the Sperry Glacier. So those are a few blasts from the past, and um, I'll just leave you with a little, a little ice screensaver because that's one of the consistent uh, images in my life these days. Um, so that gives just a little flavor of kind of what I'm looking at and what I do. Um, I'm still making a living primarily from doing trail work. Uh, this is my 20. I think I just finished my 26th season in the field. So I've now just about matched my, I had about 12 seasons, I think, of federal employment, um, all told between the Glacier, Cordova, Forest Service, and um, Denali. And I think I've just matched that with the private sector. So now I'm, I'm half and half about 26 seasons in. So I'll leave it at that for now. And I'm happy to discuss whatever people want to talk about. Yeah, that that's awesome. Tell us a little bit more, Christine, about your your trails company, I mean, are you, would this be kind of, we, we in Montana, we've really had an explosion of, of trails and communities that, um, that are used for biking and, and hiking in urban, urban communities. I know that urban has a whole different kind of concept in, in Alaska, but are you working with agency work? Is this private work? What, what, what's kind of the combination of your clientele at this juncture? Um, we're a pretty, um, a pretty uh, varied um, clientele base and project uh, style, which has been really one of the things that's kept me interested in it this long. I mean, I loved my, um, my years on a glacier trail crew, but if I were still digging drinking, um, you know, on the road up to the Mount Brown lookout, I would not still be doing it. Uh, <laughs> trail, trails has expanded in a lot of ways and um, has become for me a pretty multi-pronged um, uh, art and profession. Uh, so we have a lot of public um, land managers who are our clients. So um, this project that I just referred to working in Denali State Park is a, um, a pretty cool um, uh, mixed project funding source. The funding is federal through the Pittman Robinson grant, which brings money from, um, you guys may be familiar with that as well in Montana. It's a funding stream through ammo and um, firearms tax. So similar to the RTP money that comes via the gas tax, um, money to trails comes via ammunition. Um, so to provide hunting and backcountry access basically. So it's funded federally. It's managed by a nonprofit called the Matsu Trails and Parks Foundation. There are a lot of private donors who keep that foundation afloat. Um, there's a small match from the state park, um, the Alaska DNR um, Parks and Rec. Um, and then us, a private company. So it's a really cool model and we work in that sector quite a lot. We do a lot of um, uh, trainings and consulting for um, nonprofits who are working on behalf of public lands the way kind of the way you guys do. Um, we do uh, quite a bit of um, technical training as well. We give chainsaw trainings for you know student conservation association crews and we do um, you know, basic rock work and grip hoist training for uh, state park crews. We do um, quite a bit of uh, what we call white collar trail work, which as I near 50 years old becomes more and more of a long term solution, but we work a lot on master plans for um, uh, municipalities uh, and other landowners who have, you know, say they want to develop the trail system in their town or they have a parcel, a ski resort or a recently conservation easement deeded parcel where they want to develop it in a sustainably trail um, oriented way. And so we come in with a, a team of, you know, architects and landscape architects, and we kind of come on as the ground truthing trail experts and um, have really enjoyed that type of project as well. So any given month in the summer, we might go from, you know, digging new bench in a rocky alpine area with a, with a mattock to, um, 
running a master planning meeting with a public group of 100 people who are giving input on whatever the current iteration of the um, you know the the planning objectives we've given and, and everything in between which is keeps it really interesting for sure sometimes it feels like juggling a lot of things that could hit you in the head but it's been really stimulating well as long as they're not chainsaws you're juggling you're you're in pretty good shape <laughs> which sometimes i'm sure they are so i'm going to post a question into the chat for book clubbers um christine uh talks provocatively in my view early in the book about an authentic life is built on verbs so my question to you is to think about and we can talk about later or you can add in the chat you know what are some of your verbs so i'm going to put that in the chat um, thank you for putting in states we've got all over the country the mullins from cincinnati ohio and we've got louisiana wisconsin north carolina bainbridge island washington houston texas massachusetts missouri janet brandt always representing from missouri um, rochester new york and long island uh see Valley, California, other places in California, Iowa, Minnesota, and of course, Whitefish, Kalispell, and even St. Mary. So uh, we got we got some good local uh, content there as well. Um, Christine, one of the speaking of of amazingly diverse work, one of the other things that really captured me was this idea of working uh, and rebuilding or revegetating this entire giant um, area of tundra. Mm. Um, that, that was, that really seemed like a kind of a Sperry-esque rebuild undertaking. Um, was it, was, I mean, that must've been something pretty special. Uh, yeah, it was really cool. It was, um, you know, um, I'm, uh, you were referring to the, the, um, revegetating of the Denali Visitor Center, I think. Yep. Yeah. When my first year in Denali, we started, um, in a major, uh, renovation of the whole entrance area where we put in 16 foot wide bike trails and the trail crews were using, you know, 16 foot um, articulating front end loaders and, you know, um, huge uh, equipment, like, you know, big dump beds and all the rest to move these massive tundra mats. And it was, it was really cool to see um, how development could be um, congruent with rehabilitation because the old visitor center site had been pretty heavily used and there was a lot of impact that had to be addressed in the site plan. And so um, to be able to uh, use tundra that we pulled out of the alignment that would become a bike trail and instead of having to dispose of it or you know mash it up and bring it to the dump pile to use that in a new area and watch it just blossom is really amazing was really amazing as a work um, process and then to come back to it now you know 10 years later or more and uh see how i mean most visitors would never in a million years guess the things that the before and after that you know we know from behind the scenes and i always find it really a, a cool challenge one of the things i love about trail crew mindset from early on is how can you make the most out of a fairly limited palette of materials at times in the back country for sure, but um, often in the front country, even with limited budgets and remote areas where, and this year with supply chain issues, I mean, we had lots of times where even with a big budget, you couldn't order the thing you needed. And so I really love the, um, just the DIY scrappiness that I learned really early on from my first season and figuring out how to make stuff better with what you had on hand. And I think the revegetation from on-site materials is a huge part of that same mentality. Yeah, it's a big part, obviously, as you know, from your work here in Glacier, the native plant nursery at Glacier, which was invented when they were rebuilding the Going to the Sun Road in the 70s, um, is a major part of, what, part of what we invest in to make sure that, like what you did with the tundra, when there's a trails project or there's a road project, that that can be revegetated with the local, um, the, the, the right local native plants. Um, and that just, um, it, it's such an interesting thing to think about because I think it's lost on a lot of visitors, right? You drive into the park or you walk on a trail and you, you don't think about that. And a lot of real care goes into it. I, I, I could tell in your book that that's one of the other things you picked up on in your career in your, in your 12 years um, was that there's a lot more to this than just grabbing a shovel and going and doing something, right? Yeah, yeah, very much so. I mean, I, I really think of it as an art. It's, a, it's as much a, um, a trade as a, 
I mean, we don't have a trade lineage the way, um, you know, some of the more obvious uh, construction trades do. But I, I really, my experience was very similar to that coming up um, among a lineage of people who taught me a lot of what I know and um, kind of quietly, one of whom I see, hey, Chris Berkey there. We used to call him Berkey. Hi, Berkey. <laughs> he was, Chris was a leader my first year um, and we worked together for years. I wondered if I'd see any old faces, familiar faces. Um, so uh, that was a real, uh, a treasured part of the whole experience for me. And um, I, um, I think that, um, <clears throat> oh, let's see, I just lost the thread of what you asked me. Oh yeah, the behind the scenes part. You know, we often joke in, in a, on a trail crew that you had to be both the most arrogant type of personality to think that you could get away with doing this work for your whole life and like just try stuff and figure stuff out and behind the scenes and also really humble because you never got to take credit for anything. You know, it's very rare that anybody walking over a bridge would know, oh yeah, you know, Mark's crew did that or, oh yeah, you know, the trail crew did that in whatever year. We don't sign our work. We don't have our initials at the base in the concrete the way you do on a skyscraper. So one of the proud um, connectors among trails laborers has always been like, yeah, we do our thing and we leave and best case scenario, nobody ever guesses we were here which is kind of cool. It's almost like being a like natural resources spy or something. You just kind of <laughs> zip in on the down low and do your thing and leave. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. Hey, Grace, I'm gonna ask you to kind of, people have been really uh, involved in putting in some verbs and I thought maybe we'd take a minute and just kind of go through some of that rich sharing. Yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of comments. Um, just to name a few, we had practice, learn, understand, experience, laugh, walk, grow, and there's so much more. It's hard to keep track of all of them, but I'll make a list of everyone's comments here. That's really cool. And you know, uh, Chris, now that you've been outed, you, 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 know, you can also tell stories about Christine if you want. So it's an equal, we're an equal opportunity program here. <laughs> <laughs> be careful you don't want to give him the mic for long we're all going to be uh, in deep trouble <laughs> oh, that's great um so uh we, we also um have a little bit of a speed round for christine um and maybe then pe po folks feel free to ask questions either unmute yourself or just use the chat feature as, as usual so uh, you know christine being a local we had to find out if we, we need to find out a few things. And if people want to use the chat also to answer um, my uh, my speed uh, my speed round questions. Um, so many of you will have been around long enough to remember Frida's. So the question is Frida's or Packer's Roost? So yeah, Doug, when he originally ran this question by me, he said Packer's Roost and something. Stonefly. Stonefly, which I was like, I've never heard of that. That was, that was way after my time. So we went with... Frida's and Packer's Roost and Frida's was where we always had beers, the crew coming out of a hitch. It was right there in the park. Um, I, and I went to Packer's Roost a handful of times, but I have a funny story about Packer's Roost, which was when we were, my first year, I had a quarter inch buzz cut. Um, I had shaved my head in a fit of peak because of something, I don't remember what. And I was just like, I'm getting this hair out of here. And Gabe, my husband had a ponytail and um, Slim, the the one of the Packers in the book who I spent a bit of time developing, who was the real crabby cowboy with the black hat. And he was like, what's up with these kids and their messed up hairdos? He looks like a girl, she looks like a boy. They go to Packers Roost, they're gonna get their asses kicked. So that was my first introduction to, to Packers Roost. And I was always like, ooh, do we dare go there? Are we gonna get you know kicked out because of our mixed up hairdos? So I would say Frida's on that one. That's pretty funny. Well, my coworker Sean O'Leary is from Butte, so that's a that's a tame story um, <laughs> in, in Butte parlance, as where they like to say, "Is this a uh, private fight, or can anyone join?" Uh, <laughs> so, Sperry or Granite Park? Well, I mean, I was the Sperry crew for six seasons, so I got to go with Sperry. I love Sperry; like a, it was like my neighborhood. But um, the Granite Park swimming pool is pretty hard to beat. And I, when I went up to Granite to visit Gabe, my husband, who was the Granite leader for years, um, I got to relax. So Sperry for work and Granite for getting, you know, getting to hike in the, the paper and a bag of peanut M and, and get treated like royalty. <laughs> and so, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, we, we got to live the Sperry 
uh, the burning down of Sperry Chalet in very real terms in very real time here. Tell us how that news landed for you and, and, and what that looked like from afar as we, you know, we worked to, to bring the old girl back. Yeah, I, I don't remember exactly where I was, but I think I found out a little bit after because I like a lot of major news in the world, which I write about in the book about 9-11, but I didn't find out. I think I was in the back country when it actually happened. And um, I didn't find out about it until maybe a week or two after when I came out and was back on email. I have a lot of friends still in Western Montana and in the Glacier area. And um, I remember just hearing about it, like um, just gobsmacked to imagine First of all, what, how a fire would pick up that much head of steam to get to burn that hot all the way up there. There aren't that, there weren't that many trees. You know, when I was up there, it was very rare that the, the creek would run dry. There was a lot of snow. We typically had snow around the cabin for, you know, darn near through August. We hiked up and skied on the glacier all summer long. We had, you know, just, it was hard for me to picture it that dry and that um, vulnerable. Um, so that was kind of a mind, um, just a, expanding my mind anyway. Um, and then I just heard little bits and pieces of it. Um, a, a friend of mine, um, Bob Jellison, who some of you might know, he was a packer, or a packer and worked um, with Jack Polzine in the um, uh, carpentry end of things off and on over the years. And I think he gave me a couple updates that Jack stayed to manage a lot of the, um, the improvements and the uh, renovations. I think I'm getting that right and retired pretty, soon after that. He was the maintenance or the um, chief of maintenance when I was there as well. And he was kind of a legendary fellow. So it was good to know that it was in good hands. You know, there were some really skilled people who loved that area and knew, had the, the um, level of art, um, building arts that were needed to bring that um, incredible uh, infrastructure back to life up there. And I was really glad to hear that it's, uh, it's managed to make a um, I mean, it'll be weird if I, when I get back up there to see it, that I didn't see it at its worst. It'll be a little bit harder for me, I think, to picture the real rebound that happened. But um, yeah, it was pretty, pretty incredible. Well, Bob and Jack were part of the initial crew, right? When it burned down in late September, the first thing was these walls are not going to stand up unless we prop them up. <clears throat> so Jack came up with a plan and needed 15 people to agree to go camp in the snow um, with limited food for two weeks to try and shore that up. And I have a feeling that you would, would have been on that crew if you were still here. Yeah, we probably would have gotten pulled over into that, I'm sure. It, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, we were just, you know, two or three of us in that little cabin, which has been since been up, updated. I hear it's pretty nice now, the little trails cabin at the back end of the Sperry lot. Um, when we were up there, it was just a little plywood shack pretty much with a tool shed that was almost bigger than the kitchen. Um, but yeah, we would get pulled over into lots of projects, search and rescues and, you know, helping, um, helping the maintenance guy, uh, you know, do something with the million dollar, the million dollar shitter and <laughs> kind of whatever in between. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's always something. Okay, one last uh, speed round question, uh, PBR or moose drool? <laughs> Well, um, moose drool was on tap at my wedding in Fullbridge, so I got to go with moose drool. Okay, all right, that's fair. I do know the book does say that you know PBR is the number one you know trail crew, um, but we have modernized since since the time you were you were here in. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was uh, yeah I was saying earlier to Doug before this started that you know PBR back when I was on the crew in the late '90s, it didn't have quite the like hipster cachet that it does now. So I'm a little I'm a little more. Uh, <laughs> reticent to claim PBR as my my favorite, but we we drank a fair bit of them back then. Actually, it used to or the Packers used to be say they wouldn't pack you in if you didn't have a certain amount of beer per person because they had no idea if you'd stay. So that was really, really back then. <laughs> That's pretty good. I like that. Uh, well, Grace, I see that we've gotten some uh, bunch of questions in the chat, so um, so I'll hand it over to you to uh, to uh, manage that. All right, well, we'll kick it off with a question from Carl and Candy, who want to know if it's hard to find workers to do this kind of hard work. Um, you know, not not in my experience, um, just the, the, this past season is the first season that Gabe and I have hired a crew in the private sector. So I, I'm not quite up on what every public agency has, but generally speaking, um, no, I mean, we had a we had four slots to hire for, and we had 
pretty close to 30 applicants, I think. I mean, we had, it was a very high wage job because it's a Davis Bacon project, which is, you know, federal prevailing wages. So that tends to be appealing. But um, in Alaska, at least, there, there's a lot of interest in and um, excitement about um, practical skill jobs. I think especially after a bit of a swing in the early 2000s toward people thinking the really cool jobs were online and in tech and all that. We're now seeing a, a big resurgence of people in high school and college in their early 20s who just want to be outside. They don't. They don't want to. They want to get off their cell phones. They want to swing a tool. They feel really proud. I mean, I can't count how many times we, you know, teach a training or lead a mentoring project where a 16-year-old kid will finish helping us build a broad boardwalk, and they'll be like, "That was the coolest thing I've ever done." You know, they have a. a I think there's a burgeoning sense of um, interest in the meaningfulness you can find in work with your hands. That's been, been pretty cool to see. And then this next question comes from Eric and Tanya who asked, did Slim follow through and name a mule after you? <laughs> you know, I never checked back to see. I, I think it was, it was actually in a way it was just better to know that that was a possibility. If, I, if he hadn't you know, it would have been disappointing. And if he had, it would be like, oh, great. What a, what a legacy. So in a way, it was kind of just perfect to know that he thought that crossed his mind to say. <laughs> um, and Ed would love if you could elaborate um, in your afterward, uh, you allude to a dark side of America's best idea. You could speak on that. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I think what I was getting at at the time was just, um, I don't know, a bit of the scales falling off the eyes, realizing the longer you spend in an agency that all agencies have their dysfunctional qualities. It's easy to think that, you know, oh, IBM and, you know, Google are the ones that are really messed up and the Glacier or the Park Service is full of just shiny eyed saints and sad to say that is not true. There are lots of, you know, power tripping middle management and you know, people who are trading favors and all kinds of stuff. So I think in part, you know, my tenure with the Park Service ended on a bit of a low note with um, some personnel related things with some middle managers who were not ethical. And so I was just trying to, I think, be realistic about that. I don't think we do ourselves any favors when we put our um, public servants on pedestals. We have to, we have to be vigilant and um, remain watchdogs. Uh, towards our, both ourselves as the public and the people who we entrust to manage the lands that we collectively treasure. Um, and then I think since then, I didn't write a lot about this in the book, but my thinking has evolved quite a bit in the last 10 years, just about the idea of America's best idea founded on America's worst idea, which is public lands founded on indigenous genocide. You know, So I think part of what I was getting at is that too, that um, America's best idea to make lands public and held in trust by everyone who calls themselves Americans is a really beautiful thing. Um, the fact that that came from uh, wrenching and booting and killing people on land that they had already held that way um, is a pretty big stain. And I think to really talk honestly about parks and, and land and, and management, we have to um, acknowledge that. Super powerful. And Kathy writes in, um, Christine, your trail work plus personal outdoor life seem pretty all consuming. How do you find time to fit in your writing? <laughs> That's a perennial question, actually. Um, I, uh, I typically write most in the winter. Um, so I've always had a bit of a seasonal, I, I think because my life as a writer grew up congruently with my life as a seasonal laborer, um, I just found a rhythm that way where I, um, I work in the summer season and the shoulder season and I just take a lot in and I, I have a pretty interior writing process. I do a lot of um, thinking and mulling and envisioning character arcs and um, kind of working out even dialogue sometimes I'll talk to myself in two different voices on the trail and um, so I, I actually think I get quite a bit of mulling done even when I'm not quote writing and then when I come to the desk in the winter I have a kind of a head of steam um, built up I, in order to, to write I feel like I have to come out of a place of some sort of pressure whether it's a question and an answer I'm getting after or a attention um, in a character 
arc or a story. Um, and so I think a lot of the non-writing season is spent generating that pressure. It's almost like an air compressor. You know, it has the little while where it has to kind of rattle in the background before it kicks on when you're ready for, for air. That's a little bit how my writing life feels. And then to kind of piggyback off that, Angela asked, did you journal on your hitches or was a lot of this written from memory? Um, you know, I've never been a big journal keeper. Um, I, I keep a four line journal where I, where every day sporadically, I, sometimes I put it down for a while, but where I, I track things more like the weather, which birds are coming back when, um, kind of major events, if I'm doing something notable, but I, I don't do much, um, interior, uh, journal writing the way you think of it. So really, I mean, I really, not only are you too tired to, <laughs> navel gaze in, in a notebook at the end of a trail crew day. Um, I also never thought when I was working on trails, I didn't think of it as something I was planning to write about. I wasn't at all doing the like, oh, I have a book contract about being a trail dog and I'm going to take notes. It was way later when I was in graduate school in Anchorage that um, I kept, I would have writing assignments and prompts that I was given in graduate school. And I just kept returning to these scenes from my glacier days. And that, you know, was how I came to start writing what eventually became the book. So I, I didn't really plan it. There were times when I sure wished I did. I mean, I, I utilized um, crewmates' memories and Gabe, my husband, who was through a lot of the scenes with me, has a way better memory for who said what than I do. But um, I did also try to make clear from the way I wrote it and the kind of authorial stance that I used that some things were if you had a tape recorder, this might not be exactly how everybody said it, but that was the gist of it. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I actually think I remembered more as I kind of reached back mining to come up with the specifics than I, than I would have even if I had had journals to just kind of pull from without having to recreate it. Susan writes, your work is physically challenging and hard. How has it impacted you as you're growing older and do you find that you are stronger? You know, that's a really interesting question that Gabe and I discuss uh, semi-frequently. What, what's the balance of the pros and cons of having had such an active working life? I mean, I think I have a lot higher um, degree of um, stamina and endurance and um, just general functional fitness than a lot of people my age who have mostly worked at desks and done more recreational fitness. Um, so that I, I think, you know, hands down, I'm, I'm aging well that way. Um, that, you know, the wear and tear issues become more um, apparent. My joints probably hurt more than somebody who works at a desk. Although again, it's like moving is moving begets moving, you know, they say that like the best way to grow older is to do so while you're moving. And that helps um, soften a lot of things. I mean, I've had my share of, of injuries and aches and pains. I just recovered from an MCL injury this past, um, this past spring on a skiing, uh, telemark skiing uh, um, fall. And I thought, oh, this is it. Now it's going to be where I have the quote 48 year old knees or whatever. And, you know, I'm fine. I did PT and I eat well and stay hydrated and my knees are great. So knock on wood, I, uh, I just keep putting one foot in front of the other and thinking that whatever the costs are, there are some benefits as well. And really at this point, um, I still love what I do enough that the days where it feels like it's too much are, are pretty slim. I'm lucky that way. I don't know. Good genes and, you know, decent health care. And <laughs> then Barb asked about bears and how you dealt with them on the trail. And if you have any tips for us. You know, um, having been in Alaska now almost 20 years, my paradigm for bear interactions has really shifted. Um, I, I, would, I wouldn't say I've ever had bear phobia, even in Glacier when I first came on the crew. I, I mean, some of that just speaks to the fact that the park managed bear and, and wildlife interactions pretty well. And I came up under leaders and um, training that was you know, useful and really common sense. We always hiked with bear spray and um, we were you know, often working with power tools and didn't really weren't making bears wanna come near us anyway. So I, I really didn't have many close calls, even in 
glacier. Gabe did have one run in with that weird um, two medicine bear that ate somebody in the late 90s. Uh, he had a spooky story around that one. But um, in, Ma in Alaska, um, the bear, human bear interactions are, are much, much wilder and with much more space around them. So it'd be very rare, you know, in the days when I'd be hiking to Granite Park and you'd hike through, um, you know, and, and come on a, in a field of glacier lilies and there might be six bears and a couple cubs and you're watching them and they're kind of close and like that would be almost unheard of in Alaska. First of all, to have bears that close to each other and then to have them that close to humans. And they're very, they're much more likely to change their behavior based on your presence. Whereas in Glacier, a lot of the bears are, you know, they're, they're doing their own thing. They're not um, licking your lunchbox or anything, but they're also not moving away. And in Alaska, it's much more, um, the circles are bigger and the movement away is much more pronounced usually. So, I mean, I just, my, my main um, bear country advice is always just to, um, a fear is actually pretty destructive. So I try often to tell people who come hiking with me or who spend time out with me or whatever, to, if they can possibly manage the just irrational, like, oh my God, is that a bear feel? They'll be much safer because you're, when your senses are in constant adrenalized fight or flight response like that to nothing, it's much harder to actually perceive the world that you're in. And so I think that is often helpful for people to just to be like, okay, my, my sort of um, calm, centered, observant self is much safer than the one who's just kind of constantly on hyper alert. Um, and then I, I do carry bear spray pretty much as a default, although I've never had to, um, never had to, you know, never shoot it. Um, I have carried a gun here and there for the Forest Service in Cordova. We worked around a lot of coastal bears um, on salmon streams where you could surprise a bear. Um, we carry uh, firearms, although I never had to use one there either. So yeah, I mean, I think like with all animals and moving in wild spaces, like humility and, um, and observant uh, attention are probably your best um, defenses. And hopefully uh, you don't end up as one of the people who just has, you know, in the wrong place at the wrong time, which I certainly have known those as well. So, but it's interesting, a, a good friend of mine, a guy who was on our, my crew and this last summer who was attacked by a bear in, in a pretty front country situation in Alaska. Um, he was completely mauled, his eye was pulled out. He had major facial reconstructive surgery. And of all people you'd think he'd have a real bone to pick or a real fear. And he said, you know, I don't, I don't fault her a bit. I was in the brush, she had a cub. She was just being a protective parent and, um, you know, I kind of admire her actually, and she didn't kill me and I'm okay. And he had reconstructive surgery and he, I don't know, I kind of admire that, um, mm. that attitude to think of them as their own intact ecosystem and they're doing their best with us as we do with them and just hope. <sighs> that Good question, yeah. everybody. <laughs> I know we have a few more that I really want to get to. Um, we'll keep going with Kate who asks about sharing trails with horses and if you have any ideas for improving those kinds of trails. Yeah, multiple user groups is, is such a tough issue. That is really one of the cruxes that we deal with in, in master plan uh, development most mostly. Um, I think the best way to, to have multiple users that are often disparate it, to share trails well is in the planning stage. It's a lot harder to do it after use is already entrenched and you know you have people at war with each other and arguing over who, who is there first and all that. So we really try to front load the planning process in opening trail systems and designing them maybe one way for one user, one way for another. Or um, in Alaska, there are some areas that are um, alternating days of the week are open to one or the other user. That can be really useful, I think, mechanized or non equestrian or foot traffic, um, mountain bike or no mountain bike, that kind of thing. Um, I think that um, hikers and horses together are always gonna be a little bit of an issue because hikers can be clueless and horses can be skittish. And that combination together is always gonna be potentially problematic. But I don't know, like any, um, any social interaction, I think 
open mm -hmm. communication is probably one of the most important things you can do after a pattern is already set that people feel like they have a representation at the table, that they have a way to have their concerns acknowledged, that safety measures are being taken. But it's certainly not something I can give an answer on in, in a minute. It's a, it's a really um, one of the most prominent questions with trail professionals is how to interface in a way that's fair and safe for um, disparate users. Lord knows I almost scared enough uh, horses and mule trains off switchbacks when I was first learning how to hike in Glacier. <laughs> and those of us who uh, slog through Cracker Lake on occasion uh, wish perhaps there were a bit more planning that went into that mud bog slash poop bog. <laughs> oh yeah, I haven't been on that in, I don't, I don't know if I've ever been to Cracker Lake actually. Yeah. Um, Eva asks, uh, what have been the reactions of other trail dogs that you worked with if they've read your book? <laughs> well, of course, you know, the ones who love it tell me and the ones who hate it don't say anything. So how would I know? <laughs> no, but uh, overall, it's been really cool. Um, I've had, you know, lots of people over the years, either through email or at conferences or whatever, um, uh, shyly or boldly tell me whatever their trail through background is and feel like this the book's kind of for our tribe which was gratifying to me because you know I, I really try I, I was clear I was writing my own experience but my hope was that it would ring true for in some ways if not in all the details obviously there are trail crew workers have all kinds of personalities and some of them are you know very different from each other and how they present to the world and I'm different than I was at 23. <laughs> So um, yeah, but in general, it's been really lovely um, reception and fun to, um, I, I'll, I'll still occasionally, right after the book came out, I got quite a lot, but I'll still occasionally get an email from somebody who's like, I'm just starting my first, my first job. Do you, what kind of boots should I get? Or like, they'll just, I don't know, somehow I, with the publicness of the book, become like the ask a trail dog person. So my husband gave joke for like one, I had a back and forth of almost a month, not too long after the book came out where this this guy asked me like everything you could think. I had to finally be like, okay, I think you might need to like go to REI or like find a buddy or something. Cause I'm not gonna be able to tell you everything you need to buy for your first job. But it was pretty, it was pretty sweet. And I have really enjoyed the um, connections I've had um, with folks um, since then. And actually since writing the book, I, my company has joined the Professional Trail Builders Association which is kind of our um, trade organization um, uh, membership application portfolio um, association for uh, private sector trail builders and have gotten to meet tons of people from all over the country who are doing similar work and that's been really fun too. A couple of really interesting questions and we're getting close to our time. I try and really keep this to an hour, but um, Annabelle and Barb kind of asked neighboring questions about, um, about volunteers and tourists, right? That in, in your book, um, they're, they kind of appear a mixed bag, uh, potentially maybe even at best a mixed bag that, um, that tourism, um, you, you know, that, that there, there obviously are good parts of that, but there are also some frustrating pieces of that. Can you kind of help suss that out a little bit more for us? Yeah, sure. That's one of the biggest uh, pushbacks that I've gotten from the book over the years is, oh, why do you have to be so mean to hikers? Why do you, why do you hate tourists? And I had to kind of laugh because it just depends on who was talking to me because the trail crew people were like, oh my God, I can't believe you were so easy on the tourists. Why didn't you talk about, you know, <laughs> the real dark side or whatever. And, and then other people who are, you know, wonderful volunteers who've done a ton of work felt like I was picking on them. And I think one thing to say is just that that was coming out of a subculture. You know, I, I, I think obviously, I think I was clear in some passages that volunteers do incredible work. There's a huge place for them. And I had some really wonderful interactions with, with uh, volunteers and hikers on the trail. I, I think of, you know, so many, especially women, elder, older women at the time who just, just warmed my heart with the the joy that they felt at seeing a woman being paid to do, uh, you know, um, skilled labor in a way that they maybe had never had access to. So, I, I, you know, I regret that um, my fondness for a lot of those interactions didn't come off as strongly as it could have perhaps, but I also know if I'd given too much away, then the trail dogs would have had me, had me uh, acting like a softie who wasn't speaking the real truth. So 
I think the biggest thing that, you know, with volunteers is just with anybody, the, the ones who, who are humble and ready to offer what they have without a lot of ego are the ones who are, who offer the most, you know, I think that the way to the volunteers and hikers would often rub crews the wrong way is when people would come in, you know, lecturing you or trying to tell you what you should be doing, or did you know they'd done this or whatever. And so I think I don't really have that much advice other than, you know, get out there and work wherever you can and do your best. But I think um, in the interface between um, professional and volunteer, the, the humility and on from both ends goes a long way. You know, a lot, a lot of professional trail builders like me have a lot to learn from. I've learned a ton from just different, you know, some old guy who showed up to volunteer with his Boy Scout kid or whatever. And I've been hope, open to that as well. And then asking the same that, you know, volunteers and hikers be open to what they can learn as well. And then I think it's a really great model. Yeah, I mean, perspective is really the whole thing, right? I mean, you, you're writing from that perspective to share that story. And all, most all of the people I, because I know most of you, all of the people on this aren't, aren't the tourists that, that we're talking about, right? We, we bring our kids in a certain way and we, we come in a different way, um, but it is challenging. We're, we're actually supporting a grant next year in the park to try and bring uh, basically a social media summit together because you know they they wanted to think about building a new um a new bathroom at iceberg because so many people were changing into their swimsuits at iceberg so they could go take the selfie out on the iceberg with the tree that they pulled out of the ground mm. um you know and and we've had people you know die in other parks who are trying to get that selfie leaning over the edge um so as we get three million right it's not all 3 million who share this America's best idea conservation I ideal. And that's, that's super challenging. How do you, how do you get that? So, um, well, we do have our, our contest winners. We put that in the chat, but Ed Wilson and Eva, congratulations to our calendar winners for the evening. Um, I think we can sneak in one more question, Grace. Um, Oh, and maybe we don't have another question. I have a couple of great comments um, that uh, that talk about you know the the great work that trails crew, crews do. Um, it really is remarkable. All of us have seen trails crew. Uh, um, we have. My wife is a big pie maker, and it is not uncommon for her to go back to the car to uh, get a pie <laughs> and drop it off with the trails crew, um, and just figure we'll get the hand back sometime later, which is appreciated. Um, Christine, thank you for spending uh, a wonderful hour with us. Thank you for um, all you've done in the park. I mean, you, I, I know exactly the switchback you're talking about as most of us do on this call at Sperry um, that, you, that you helped put in and get washed out and put in again. And um, you know, that, that is the, the way of the world, right? This is, we're in the forever business when we talk yeah. about national parks and and preserving and protecting them takes a village. And thank you for being a leader in that village and for speaking out the truth of the trail crews that make um, this magic happen. We're honored to be able to support that work through the Montana Conservation Corps. Um, you know, Carolyn came to us from uh, the Conservation Corps uh, in doing trail work. And so it's um, dirt work is God's work. Uh, and thank you for doing that and for sharing your evening with us. And, uh, for all of you, thanks for all you do to um, support our work and um, keep buying great books like Christine's. Uh, and uh, we will uh, look forward to seeing you uh, next month if you can make it. The Salish uh, um, and the Lewis and Clark expedition is next month. And then we'll be, believe it or not, off to uh, 2022. So um, we're in that time of year where we're thankful. Um, and I am thankful for all of you. And thank you again. Uh, for being with us uh, tonight, Christine, and um, I hope everybody has a great night. Thank you so much, Doug. I got a squiz. I know I'm over hours, but uh, it's been a real pleasure. I think of Montana and Glacier so often and getting to be there virtually with all of you and engage in the questions about a park we all love has been a real pleasure. So.
So thanks. Well, you, you, are, you will forever be a part of the Glacier family. Uh, so know that you have now just 30 or 40 more places to stay when you and Gabe come to the Gladhead. <laughs> Thank you. And if not Berkey, it's the, you know, the rest of us will take care of you. Okay, great. Thanks for all the work you do. It's been a pleasure to reconnect with you guys and, and uh, kind of update on your most recent efforts. So Thank you. We're proud to we're proud to have your book in all those stores in the park, and um, it's a it's it's a big hit. So great. Thanks, everyone. Good Thanks, night, everyone. Good night. Great to see. You. Remember, it's a good life if you don't weaken. <laughs> That's the best last words right there. <laughs> good night, Christine. Great to see you. Yeah, you too, Chris. Thanks for coming. Bye bye. <clears throat> great. Thank you, Christine. That was awesome.